Okay. So uh, let's get started. Um, before turning to uh, Kohut and Kernberg, I, I need to say more about Winnicott. Um, but maybe the best way to start is is just to going to go back right to the beginning um, when I talked about um, how for both Pope Francis and for Karl Stern. Um, the roots of um, the malaise of modernity in the West is what Stern called the Cartesian chasm uh, between uh, res extensa and res cogitans, between nature and reason, between object and subject, um, between mind and body. Um, and. Uh, Stern argues that psychoanalysis represents a challenge to this dualism. You can see this particularly in the way psychoanalysis challenges mind-body dualism through its study of psychosomatic illnesses. Um, but there's a sense in which Stern doesn't make this point. There's a sense in which psychoanalysis both mirrors this problem or reflects or manifests this problem and at the same time in another part of Freud's work he, over, he, he strives to overcome the problem. I, I, I early on described Freud's uh, psychological theory as a psychobiology, in, which manifests the mind-body split, the mind being superego and ego, forever in conflict with the id, which for Freud is grounded in the drives that are ultimately grounded in the body. So we have a mind-body split in Freud uh, that, uh, that, that embodies the Cartesian uh, dualism. But then Later, in Freud's thinking, he introduces the eros Thanatos theory. He, re, uh, he rethinks his drive theory. And I think a lot of the secondary sources on psychoanalysis have paid I insufficient attention to the radical change in Freud's thinking that is involved from the shift from the earlier psychobiology to the later eros Thanatos theory. Um, I think maybe they've overlooked because because he still tries to draw uh, he still tries to ground eros and thanatos in the body but melanie klein separates eros and thanatos from the body and and really produces no longer a psychobiology and uh, but but a psychology which sees the conflict not between mind and body ego and superego versus id but the conflict within the human mind and heart between loving on the one hand and hating on the other that's a very different psychology, and it overcomes what Eric Erickson called Freud's centaur model of man. We talked about the centaur as the mythical beast that has the head and torso of a human being, but the body of a horse. There is your Cartesian split, um, which part of Freud's theory reflects, but he also takes steps uh, towards, towards overcoming it. Um, uh, I, I, last week I talked about how Winnicott um, overcomes a, a certain kind of splitting in his thinking. Um, because on the one hand there's the Kleinian Winnicott, but on the other hand there's the self and relational Winnicott. And it's not as, that, it's not as if he starts out as a Kleinian and then, he, and then evolves towards a self and relational uh, thinker. Um, uh, throughout his work in the same year, he will write papers that uh, reflect a more Freudian-Kleinian perspective. And then later in the same year, he'll write a paper that seems to come almost entirely from a self-relational perspective. Um, so, you know, he can be criticized for being an unsystematic thinker, uh, but on the other hand, he can be praised for his transcending, his overcoming of splits that otherwise uh, bedevil the field. Um, so, uh, well, I, I mean, according to Hegel, all thought evolves through the clash of antitheses, right? Thesis, antithesis, so in, in, in philosophy we have people who say that the world is, uh, that, that, that mind is more real than matter. And then we have another school of thought that says that matter is more real than mind. And out of the clash of thesis and antithesis comes a third Kantian uh, attempt to work out a synthesis in which both mind and matter are somehow integrated. Um, and uh, there's a sense in which 
we could say that Winnicott is striving. I mean, that's called dialectical thinking, right? Transcending these thesis, antithesis, opposites and trying to get to a third thing, a synthesis. There's a sense in which Winnicott um, is striving for such a synthesis. He doesn't use the Hegelian language, but there is a sense in which his thinking is, is kind of dialectical. Um, it refuses to settle for one side or the other of the great divide that, that divides contemporary psychoanalysis between the Freudian Kleinians on the one hand and the self-relational people on the other. Um, okay. Uh, well, just to talk about that divide a little bit. Um, uh, you know, like the relational people, the extreme relational people, they don't know quite what to do with Melanie Klein because she's clearly an object relations theorist. She's the founder of object, well, Freud, I guess, is ultimately the founder, but, but the Klein is considered, you know, the first uh, real uh, thorough object relational thinker because she rejects Freud's primary narcissism and in says, instead of the buzzing, booming, blooming confusion at the beginning, she says there's a primitive ego engaged in a relationship with a primitively conceived object from the, from the beginning. So she's an object relations theorist, but she's not f relational in the way that mm, a lot of relationalists like because she certainly hangs on to the unconscious and she certainly hangs on to aggression in a big way. And as we've seen, Winnicott hangs on to aggression in a big way. He writes about hate in the countertransference. He says some patients can't believe in the analyst's love until they can meet the analyst's hate. Uh, he talks about how the analyst with certain kinds of patients has to find sublimated ways of showing his hatred to the patient. And he talks about the many ways in which we do show our hatred to the patients. We end the session. We charge a fee. We go on vacation. Uh, these are minor ways. But Winnicott's also talking about other ways, like he picked that kid up and physically took him out of the house and put him outside and locked the door. The buzzer was there. When the kid was ready to be civilized, he could come back in. Winnicott uh, had a sense of how, especially with more primitive patients, the analyst has to have his hate available. He has to be conscious of it. He says if you, if you can't become conscious and make your hate available, you can't work with seriously disturbed people. You might be okay with neurotics, but you're not going to be able to work with borderline and psychotic people uh, unless you have your hate uh, available. Um, um, I thought it would be the other way around. Why? Uh, probably. So the, I have to repeat the question. So the question is, wouldn't it be the other way around? Wouldn't the neurotic be more able to handle the hate than than the more seriously disturbed person? Um, probably, but 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 they're not manifesting hate so much, and uh, they've got their own hate more under control. They've achieved ambivalence. In other words, their hate is modulated by their love because they've reached the ambivalent stage, they've reached the depressive position. So their hate is damped down by their love, and their hate and their, their their love is interfered with by their hate. But when you put the love and hate together, you have a modulating process. And that's neurosis. Um, and uh, um, so they're not they're not they're not directing um, intense hatred at the analyst. Um, and uh, Therefore, there's, there's, there's less need for the analyst to have his own hate available and, uh, and under control so that he can use it. I mean, in work with more disturbed patients, they have such hate that the analyst has to be able to meet that. And he has to be able to survive it. Um, he has to be able to not hurl it back. Uh, and no one's advocating hurling it back. Uh, what Winnicott is talking about is some way of sublimating the hate that I experience in relation to hateful patients. Sublimating that, containing it, processing it, and then finding a, w a way that's useful to, 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 to intervene firmly, um, bluntly sometimes, um, succinctly. I mean, there are a lot of ways in which we water down our interpretations. We go on, I wonder if it could possibly be the case that you may possibly have been experiencing me as 
and now the whole f- moment is gone, right, mm-hmm. uh, with all of this waffling. Uh, so let me unmute you. There's a couple <laughs> of hands up here. Unmute. Okay. Go ahead. I was wondering if you could possibly give uh, an example of that, the analyst having their needs available, a scenario. How does that look like in action? Okay. Um, so... Uh, So a patient presents to the therapist and the patient is incredibly angry person and she is feeling terribly victimized and uh, misused and she's so angry about being misused herself that she's completely oblivious to how she's misusing her son. Um, And the therapist being a compassionate person is very much identifying with the son who's being hurt. Um, And and, and so makes makes a comment um, to the patient that just infuriates the patient because it feels like she's more thinking about the child than she is about the patient. Um, and, and if, if the therapist had, uh, had her hate more available, um, um, she might have been able to firmly say to the patient, um, uh, you're in trouble. Uh, and uh, you need my help and you need to stay in therapy because you're really in trouble um, now that I, that may not seem like it manifests hate but it's blunt it's firm um, it's it's challenging the patient um, and it's not just empathizing with the patient it's um, it's being strong uh, in the face of the patient. Uh, I, I, I could probably think of other examples, but that's the best I can do at the moment. Uh, and uh, Jacqueline, I think you had... Uh, uh, no, no, okay. All right. Let me <coughs> mute you again. Okay, so let's come back to, to this idea of dialectical thinking that transcends these opposing uh, perspectives. Um, The relational people love this other aspect of Winnicott's thinking, which is all about ego relatedness and uh, the baby's need for an attuned uh, caretaker who is neither intrusive nor abandoning. Um, How if the baby doesn't get enough of that, development is derailed. This, this is what Kohut will call self-object function. The mother needs, or Bion will call containing function, but the baby needs a mother who is attuned to the baby's affects, is able to contain the baby's affects, um, is able to empathically attune with the baby's experience. Winnicott is all about this. But on the other hand, Winnicott uh, is all about... Um, both the baby's hate and the mother's hate for the baby. And the patient's hate for the analyst and the analyst's hate for the patient. And how that has to be coped with. Okay, so he's working both sides of the of the street here. Okay, the, I, I, in giving you Winnicott to read, I didn't give you probably what is his most important and some people would say his most famous paper, and that's his paper on transitional objects and transitional phenomena. So I just need to talk a little bit about that because this is the area where Winnicott, in a sense, is, mo- is if not being dialectical, he's giving a kind of, I'll, another way of arriving at the same in- insights as dialectical thinking. He's saying that the child um, normally um, 
uh, invests libidinally in some toy or some soft object, Linus's blanket, a teddy bear, um, and this object um, uh, it, it stands for it's kind of a proto-symbol. Um, Winnicott's cuts a bit misleading about this. He, he says it's the first not-me object, but the point is that the transitional object is not fully a not-me object, neither is it fully a me object. It's neither fully me nor fully not-me. It's neither fully mother nor fully not-mother. Uh, it, it exists in this in-between area, and the adult mustn't ask is it real or is it imaginary? Is it invented is it, or is it found in the world? Is it entirely subjective or is it entirely objective? It's not entirely subjective nor entirely object. It's both subjective and objective. In other words, we, we mustn't ask. We mustn't force the question. Okay, this sounds a bit obscure, but it becomes much easier to understand when uh, later he uh, broadens out from the transitional object to transitional phenomena and to the transitional area, and he associates the transitional area, this in-between area that's not either fully subjective nor fully objective, he says this is the area of cultural experience, and he says this is where art and theater and cinema and religion resides in this transitional area. Uh, and so let's start with the arts. Um, let's talk about going to a movie. We say there's a willing suspension of disbelief. You're not going to enjoy the movie. Uh, if you're sitting there saying, oh, it's just light reflected from back here onto this screen, you know. Uh, without a willing suspension of disbelief, the whole magic of the artistic experience is gone. Um, and Winnicott is much liked by, by psychoanalysts who are friendly to religion, because unlike Freud, who says, ah, bah, it's all subjective illusion, Winnicott says people need to take holidays from reality testing. Uh, trying to be objective and scientific is very important for Winnicott, but it's hard. And we need rests. We need R&R &R from the hard work of reality testing. And so we need retreats into this transitional area where for a time we are exempted from this task of separating out the subjective from the objective. And he places religion in this transitional area. Um, so, now, I, I, in, in my recent book, I've elaborated on this, because I think that in, in talking about the transitional area, uh, people following Winnicott have, have only gotten half of the story and neglected the other half of the story. Um, I'm suggesting that there's two ways of falling out of the transitional area. You can fall out of it uh, by uh, failing to engage in the willing suspension of disbelief. But you can also fall out of it by failing to engage in the willing suspension of belief. See, to be in the transitional area, you must neither believe nor disbelieve. People are always asking me, so what is it, Carveth? Are you a believer or aren't you? And I'm saying, don't ask me that question. Um, uh, let, let me reside in the transitional area where I'm exempted. Okay, well, people who fall out of the transitional area, well, let's take a movie, okay? Uh, it's not that they're not engaging in a willing suspension of disbelief. They're so into the movie, they think the bad guy's about to commit murder, and before he does, they run up to the screen and try to interfere. Well, they've fallen into belief. They, they're, they're taking it literally. Um, and fundamentalists in religion take it literally. They have fallen into a, a religious literalism. They're taking it absolutely concretely and magically. So for the devout, 
old style Roman Catholic, when the bread and the wine are blessed, it literally becomes the body and blood of Christ. And it mustn't be left lying around the sacristy. Um, uh, and they interpret the whole thing magically and literally. Um, there are other religious traditions that exist more in the transitional area. Um, they, uh, such people go into the magical zone the way we all go into a magical zone when we enjoy a good film. We're neither believing it nor are we disbelieving it. We're suspending both belief and disbelief and we're enjoying it on that transitional level. And it is possible to relate to a religious tradition in exactly that way. Um, so I think we need to add to Winnicott's understanding about the need to suspend disbelief into also seeing the need to suspend belief. Right? Two ways to fall out of the transitional. Become a believer, become a disbeliever. And, and now he associates this transitional area with the area of play. This is where play resides. So you, you want to go to a good play and enjoy it as play, you have to suspend both belief and disbelief. Um, so the issue becomes whether you can play or not. And, and for Winnicott, play is like an incredibly important thing. Yes? Oh, Hazel has a question. Oh, has a question. Uh, let me... Okay, yes. Oh, you're, you're still not... Okay. I think we've got you now. Okay, thanks. I was wondering if you think that the state expression may, may be someone um, falling into a transitional state. Like it looks like a depression sometimes. Falling into or out of? The transitional area yes. you're talking about. Yes. Do you think that someone has fallen no, I don't think so at all. Uh, I don't think so at all. I um, someone who's depressed for me has fallen into the. I have to now talk Melanie Klein. Um, depression takes place in the paranoid schizoid position. Okay, uh, this is a common misunderstanding. I wish Klein had not chosen the word depressive position because it suggests that depression resides in the depressive position and it never does. Anyone who's in, who's in the depressive position is never depressed. Well, what she meant was that in the depressive position we have depressive anxiety, which she meant what Winnicott calls the capacity for concern. Okay, depressive anxiety is my fear that in my crazy paranoid hostility. I thought I was killing a bad object, but now I see the object is also good. Is it time to get her to the hospital? That's my concern, okay? Um, uh, so y you, you have depressive anxiety in the depressive position. You have a capacity for concern in the depressive position, but you don't have depression. Depression means you see yourself as all bad. You've lost any sense of your goodness. Okay, that's, that's, that, that's not, you, you've fallen into a literal, you've fallen out of the transitional area into a literalism. I am literally a useless, worthless human being who should die. That's depression. Um, that's the opposite of transitional. If you were in the transitional area, you would have a, you, you would have a sense of both your goodness and your badness. Your badness would be counteracted by your awareness of your goodness, and vice versa. You're not going to get carried away and get all manic about how wonderful you are, because you're also going to be aware of your dark side. Okay, so the transitional area is, is, is like, that's what I said, it's like a synthesis. It's like a both-and, as opposed to an either-or. All right? And, and therefore, play can go on meaningfully in the transitional area. Um... So I just think Winnicott's a genius, and I, I think, uh, oh, I wanted to also suggest that, there, that Winnicott offers a solution that um, I, I suggested in my book. Um, see, the, the Kleinian PSD is too dualistic. You're either in PS or you're in D. But surely there are some mental phenomena that are not so neatly categorized as either PS or D. 
So I think there's a transitional area between P, S, and D. I think this is where Winnicott's transitional area resides. Uh, in other words, in the transitional area, you have not fallen into either the magical thinking of PS, nor have you fallen into the objective scientific thinking of D. You're playing in an area between PS and D, which is where I think Winnicott's transitional area resides. And I think it's really important to understand this in order to understand the arts, to understand um, non-literal, non-fundamental experiences of the sacred. Uh, by the way, um, I suffered for many years, like many sociologists, from a tendency to associate the sacred with the religious. Um, Durkheim, the sacred and the profane. Um, and so I associated the sacred with the religious until my, my old mentor, Eli Sagan, said, Don, what, what are you talking about? There's all kinds of the secular sacred, like the life of a child, like the sacredness of the marital bond, like the sacredness of democratic principles, of the Constitution, of the Canadian Bill of Rights and Freedoms, of, of, of anti-racism. These kinds of values people can hold sacred. It doesn't have to have anything to do with religion whatsoever. We've got, we got to stop letting religion corner the market on the sacred. <laughs> um, okay. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. What happens if uh, someone is too much all the time in that transitional space? Oh, very good question. Thank you for asking that. I meant to say something about that, actually. So the question is, what happens if someone is too much all of the time in the transitional area? Okay, and, and I, and I want to remind the Winnicottians. You see, like in, in, in the American Psychological Association, Division 39 is psychoanalysis, but Division 36 or something is psychology and religion. And, the and, and, and many people belong to both. There are a lot of psychoanalysts who belong to the psychology and religion section. And these people are religion friendly. And they love Winnicott, but they misuse Winnicott, in my humble opinion. Um, they interpret Winnicott to imply that mental health is pitching your tent in the transitional area, living there. Uh, I mean, setting up your habitation, living too much in the transitional area, and therefore they do this as a justification for, for, for religion. They think of religion as residing in the transitional area, and they forget that why did Winnicott call it the transitional area? Because it's an area where you're supposed to make an important transition. For Winnicott, it's a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. Um, he, he's saying, he's agreeing with Freud ultimately. Ultimately, he's saying we have the, the, we have the, the, the task of d separating subjective and object. We are required to test reality. We are required to face reality. We are required to grow up and transcend wishful illusions. And he's completely with Freud on this. But he says, unlike Freud, he says, it's so hard. I have compassion for poor human beings. All of the work to test reality is so hard. People need vacations. They need relief. They need to be able to play. They need to be able to go back into this transitional area. He reminds me here of, of one aphorism by, by Friedrich Nietzsche. I, I, I'm not a big fan of certain other af aphorisms of Friedrich Nietzsche, but, but nevertheless, this one's good. He, uh, Nietzsche anticipates the Freudian theory of regression. He says, uh, he says uh, oh, uh, you think he's falling back. You think he's regressing. You think he's regressing. No, you misunderstand him. He's simply stepping back to take a run to make a big leap forward. That's Nietzsche. Okay, so he's saying sometimes what looks like regression is just a temporary... Okay, the kid's going to school for the first day and the thumb is back in the mouth. It hasn't been there for two years, but the thumb is back. That's temporary to help him make this big leap forward into a whole day at school by himself, okay? So Winnicott has a great sense of how we need these temporary regressions. But sooner or later, holiday time is over, it's back to work. It's back to the work of reality testing. 
So, so he, he, he's, uh, just let me finish off on this question here. So, so someone who is spending too much time in the transitional area is a person who, I think, Winnicott would say, wait a minute, this is supposed to be just a transition. It's supposed to help you make a transition. It's supposed to help you grow up. Uh, you're spending too much time at the theater. You gotta come out of the theater and, 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 and face certain things, so, uh, dark things. Like the fact that you're dying, for example, as all of us are, um, and these are very painful things that that ultimately have to be have to be faced. So Winnicott, I believe, is misused sometimes um, to sort of justify living in illusion, and he was not justifying living living in illusion. Uh, you know, he had sympathy for our need to do it from time to time. So you had a question over here, yeah. just right behind you. There. Uh, well, uh, you kind of answered my question. It was just, I wanted to know, I guess conceptually, if Winnicott would have agreed with Freud that religion was an illusion that one should, I guess, divorce himself from eventually. So the question is, would Winnicott have agreed with Freud that religion is ultimately an illusion that one has to divorce oneself from ultimately? Um, I think it's more complicated than that. I think, I think he would have been more in agreement with Freud than a lot of people want to think, in the sense that he shares Freud's um, valuation of facing reality and giving up, uh, but not totally giving up. I mean, because Winnicott would add to Freud, well, no one can give it up entirely. It's too hard. Look, I mean, uh, Winnicott sort of would agree with T.S. Eliot. T.S. Eliot said, Humankind cannot bear very much reality, unquote. Humankind cannot bear very much reality. Uh, Freud, Freud would have thought, well, we can bear more reality than probably Eliot thinks, but um, Win Winnicott, <laughs> Winnicott shares uh, Eliot's idea that um, reality is really hard to bear. Uh, really hard to bear. And, um, and people should strive their best to bear it. And we should try to be sane. Um, but we need holidays. We need vacations. We need the willing suspension of disbelief and the willing suspension of belief. We need to play in this area. And, and when we play in this area, we then can come back and pick up the responsibility of testing reality again. So, so I think Winnicott would not have liked fundamentalist religion. He would not have liked religious literalism. Um, but he probably, um, I like to, well, he was an Anglican, you know. Um, and um, and uh, he probably, like me, would have liked the smells and the bells. Um, but he probably wouldn't have taken it literally. Uh, like, I don't take it literally. Uh, but that's just me wishing that Winnicott fought like me. <laughs> <laughs> uh.